네, 안녕하세요 블록미디어 시청자 여러분 오늘은 저희 블록미디어 스튜디오에 절깃 코파운더 마틴님을 모시고 한번 같이 이야기를 나눠보려 합니다 Hello, Martin. Hi, Ethan. It's my pleasure to be here doing interview with the Block Media. Um, Korean Blockchain Week uh, 2024 has been amazing so far. I love being in Korea and love being here. Yeah. Thank you very much for coming here. Can you briefly introduce uh, Jerky to the Korean audience and kind of the things about the yourself? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, my name is Martin. I'm a technical co-founder at Zerkit. Uh, Zerkit is a new layer two. Uh, it's a zero knowledge rollup, uh, which is built using uh, the OP stack from which we have taken out everything that resembles optimistic rollups and re uh, replaced it with uh, zero knowledge machinery. Uh, the focus of Zerkit is on security. So uh, what we do a little bit differently than other rollups is that uh, when we receive transactions that are supposed to be included in blocks. Uh, we first simulate them, we obtain an execution trace for each transaction, and then we feed it to some AI enabled uh, engine, we call it the Oracle. And we ask it one simple question, is this transaction good for the blockchain? Or is it a hack? And if the transaction is a hack, we put a flag on it, we say that we uh, put it in uh, quarantine, and the transaction doesn't make it into the next block. So this way, we are trying to protect the protocols and users who are using uh, Zerkit and foster a little bit safer environment. Oh, yeah. And I think that's the kind of the really interesting feature is like you mentioned that AI and after sequencer, right? Yes, that's correct. Uh, for me, I think it's kind of hard to understand how the how the AI is choosing the, the transaction will be helpful for the network or not. Can you share more details uh, how it works? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, first of all, if you take a look at sequencing, the sequencers of uh, blockchains or of rollups in general, they have one particular role. The particular role is to receive transactions and order them into a sequence. Hence, they are called uh, the sequencer. So in our particular case, this part actually doesn't change. We follow exactly the same sequencing rules uh, as uh, Ethereum and other EVM compatible rollups. So we follow the gas, gas uh, pricing, auction market, uh, and so on. So all of this is deterministic. Where AI comes into play is that uh, determining whether a transaction is a hack or is it not a hack. So because Zerkit is uh, EVM equivalent, uh, we can actually take a look at all the other EVM compatible and equivalent chains that are out there and at all the hacks that happen on those chains in the history, right? Even before Zerkit existed. And uh, we have done that and uh, use this data to actually produce a classifier machine learning type classifier. That's the artificial intelligence in there. Uh, and that part only tells us whether a transaction is a hack or whether it is not a hack. So it actually doesn't influence the ordering of the transactions that follows the standard rules. It is there only to answer that one question. Is this transaction malicious? Mm. So that's how AI integrates with the sequencer. Mm, I see. Yeah. So yeah, I think it's really great idea to make a kind of the AI filtering system. Is that correct to say that? Yes, yes yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But I also think that kind of the questions like the, how can you build the that filters? Because maybe someone is trying to make some kind of the, their own standard for the their filtering. So it may, it may seem like the, it may be not the kind of the bad as it works. Uh, Maybe it is the hacking kind of the code kind of the hackings. It is obviously the bad, but maybe someone thinks that this filter can work like the centralized control for the network. What do you think about that? Yes. Uh, so I admit that you know that opinion is valid. Uh, the system, you know, in theory, actually could go haywire and say, uh, you know, we are just gonna 
censor you know everybody mm -hmm. and not allow them to use the blockchain in the first place but he, here's the deal like if it ever happens then first of all because mm -hmm. we run centralized sequencer we can actually fine-tune the system right so we can make the particular adjustments mm -hmm. that uh, we need to uh, make so that this doesn't happen and second if it ever happens then we will not have any users we will mm -hmm. not have any community right we always want to provide the users with the possibility to exit the chain mm -hmm. so if you know something is not to their particular liking they will always be able to take their funds and actually leave back onto uh, ethereum mm -hmm. with those funds so this is our uh, let's say number one uh, you know premise and mm -hmm. uh, objective and given that if the users do not like how our filtering system behaves mm -hmm. then you know they are free to do so Right. Mm. We do not want to force anybody to I see, yeah. you know, do I see, anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, frankly, that even for me, I'm using the kind of the DApps very frequently, but still we have some kind of the worries like the, oh, is it okay to do trusted platforms or the trusted transactions or things? So mm -hmm. if you can provide that kind of the trustworthy network user experience like Jerkit, I think it can have some kind of the more or in mass adoption of the Web3 industry, right? So that's the kind of things you are looking for? I absolutely agree. I mean, uh, you know, when you look at DeFi, uh, many critics of DeFi mm -hmm. say, well, it's not safe. It's full yeah, of, you right. know, scams. Mm -hmm. uh, people can get hacked, right? And when a major hack happens, uh, it actually impacts and negatively impacts the entire industry. So mm -hmm. we are trying to create a network that simply has a safer environment mm -hmm. uh, for everybody to feel safer and uh, for the industry to not be poorly reflected on by such events. Mm, I see. Yeah, I think the trust force is the kind of the mm -hmm. key features of the circuit, right? Yes, um, absolutely. Frank, there is the, so many rare tools in the recent days, right? So can you share some more features that you think that circuit is much better than the other former project or something? The reason that you think that circuit will be kind of the prominent in the rare two? Yes, so um, I don't really want to say, you know, Zerkit is absolutely better yeah, yeah, sure, in sure, sure. every yeah. single respect. Like, obviously, the landscape of rollups and layer twos is rich. The, you know, primary purpose of every single uh, layer two is to scale the layer one or scale Ethereum, right? So we very obviously uh, fulfill this purpose. Uh, in fact, we have extremely fast block time. Zerkit produces a block every two seconds. That is, you know, comparing to uh, 12.5 seconds that we actually have on Ethereum. If you take a look at other layer twos, uh, the block time, the you know, rate of block production is, is a little bit different. So uh, I almost want to say that Circuit has, uh, you know, the fastest mm -hmm. block time in the industry, and therefore it provides the largest uh, transaction mm -hmm. processing ca capacity mm -hmm. uh, that is currently available, and this directly projects into the gas price right because the gas prices that the users have to pay they are based on an auction uh, if the block space is scarce the gas fees will be actually higher mm -hmm. so uh, right now circuit is uh, actually pretty cheap now we do subscribe uh, to the idea that uh, rollups and l2s are here not to only scale otherwise we would have you know a whole bunch of networks that are pretty much the same and they do not contribute anything new. So we actually do try to innovate, right? Mm -hmm. I mentioned it before, our sequencer is uh, centralized and uh, it is centralized for the sake of us being able to produce these innovations. Mm -hmm. And uh, the sequencer level security, that is the analysis of transactions before including them in blocks and removing the hacks. Mm -hmm. This is the first innovation that we are sort of bringing mm -hmm. to the I space. See. No other network at this moment this does this. Yeah, I see that you guys are really caring about the ecosystem itself to make a better ones and make more person easily using the Web3 network. And recently, I think some says that we don't need the kind of the layer two because the Ethereum gas fee is so low recently. So some, some influencers are saying something like that. And our core audience is the kind of the retail users who are interested in the web industry, but doesn't have the big tech nerd. So can you share more details about the, why we still need a layer two system for the web industry and how it can have the kind of the mass adoption for the normal persons again? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh 
you know, it is all about the opportunity to actually innovate, right? Uh, when you take a look at Ethereum, the main expectation that the entire community has for the Ethereum network as the main net is that it's absolutely yeah. stable, right? So if you want to introduce any kind of changes into Ethereum, you have to go through a pretty complicated process of submitting a proposal, you know, that proposal has to get sufficient support, then uh, it has to be implemented, it has to be, you know, properly tested, and then you are going to be waiting for some scheduled fork where or an upgrade of the network where uh, this actually you know becomes reality right this process is actually not so friendly for uh, innovation it's it's very stable and you know it's important that it is done this way but it's in the end very slow and not so friendly for innovation and as I said we do subscribe to uh, the idea that L2s are here to innovate these innovations they you know can revolve around security as we are doing right now but they can also you know introduce new features and other features right they can they can you know make life uh, much simpler for uh, the audience and the community and the end users so uh, what we are trying to do here is we want uh, first and foremost to not change anything for the users who are mm -hmm. already using some other L2s or Ethereum itself right uh, so uh, we are actually EVM compatible you will be able to use exactly the same wallets if you're a developer you will be able to use exactly the same tools and this is for us to sort of give you the opportunity to you know go to your friend who already is onboarded in the web3 space who already knows you know what they are doing uh, so that they can explain to you and show you and help you uh, if, if that uh, needs be then you know on the innovation space again we are you know running in a more centralized way and it is for the good reason it is so that you you know, if something is, uh, you know, suboptimal, when we see an opportunity to actually make something simpler for the end users, so that we can actually do it, and we can do it quickly. Yeah, you know? sir. Yeah. And as I search something, kind of the ecosystem of the Zerkit, mm -hmm. what I feel like is that you guys are trying to make it easier for the retailers and the kind of the common persons who are not friendly with the best industry and the kind of the making more developers in your ecosystem. You are trying to really hard to make that kind of the work, right? And I see that there is the, some different program, like the build to earn in the jerk yes. I think it's really different from the other layers and other networks, like the grant programs. It's really different. Can you share more details about the, how it works? Yes, absolutely. So, uh, you know, if we look back into mm -hmm. the evolution of Zerkit, uh, we actually launched our testnet last mm -hmm. year yeah. uh, in November uh, in 2023 at uh, DevConnect in Istanbul. And then, you know, we knew that uh, it will take us a little bit of time uh, to actually prepare the mainnet, right? Mm -hmm. We yeah. wanted to uh, make sure that our code is properly tested, that, uh, you know, users run some solid volume of transactions so that if there are any problems with it, they exhibit on the testnet mm -hmm. phase, then we can fix everything, prepare mainnet. So we sort of knew that uh, it will take us at least until this summer, uh, which, you know, happened to be <laughs> yeah. true, uh, to actually release mainnet. So, uh, you know, in the meantime, we actually had some time to focus on the community uh, work as well, because, you know, launching a network, it's not only about uh, developing the network and preparing the technology, you actually, you know, need to have some projects on the network yeah, in the first right. place mm -hmm. so that the end users have something to use right and then you have to work with your community to actually uh, develop the awareness and mm -hmm. so on so this is what we started doing uh, in uh, early 2024 and uh, you know, we started doing it by uh, developing two programs, actually. One is uh, the staking program on Zerkit, where we prepared a smart contract on uh, layer one on Ethereum mainnet, where users are able to deposit, uh, you know, some uh, specific LSTs and LRTs uh, that they hold. Uh, it is a pure deposit contract, so you can deposit into it and you can withdraw from it at uh, any point because you're depositing the yield 
yield bearing tokens, uh, you are also going to be, you know, profiting from the yield uh, from those tokens. Uh, that doesn't change uh, at all. And those tokens, they are not, you know, changing forms or getting restaked anywhere else. They are literally deposited yeah. in that smart contract. So they are absolutely safe. But the purpose of this smart contract is that these funds are sort of pre-committed to uh, enter the DeFi ecosystem on Zerkit. So there is one function in that smart contract where users, users deposit the funds that allow us to bridge these funds from the smart contract onto L2, uh, onto Zerkit, after users actually give their approval by signing some specific uh, message for us. Now we do it this way so that the users can actually stake and you know give us uh, or like uh, commit these tokens mm -hmm. for bridging onto L2 and then they do not have to pay gas on mainnet to actually uh, execute that bridging yeah. action. We will do all of that for them, right? But again, it is possible only provided that they do sign a message that expresses the approval. Uh, otherwise, they can just simply withdraw these tokens. So this is uh, our staking program. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I said that these uh, tokens, they are pre-committed to uh, enter the DeFi ecosystem on uh, Zerkit, right? So we also need to somehow incentivize the development of the DeFi ecosystem on Zerkit, which is where uh, the Build to Earn program uh, sort of comes into play, right? But we never felt that it would be fair to only say, please only develop DeFi, because you know, if yeah, you want right. to have a flourishing uh, ecosystem on any kind of network, mm -hmm. uh, you need much more. There are more interesting applications than you know, simply just DeFi, right? There are games, there are NFTs, there yeah. are you know, various governance platforms and, and a lot more. And I hope that in the future, there will actually be a lot more. So uh, we actually created a program that is uh, very sort of free form. So when you uh, go onto uh, our website and you find the uh, build to earn form, uh, it just asks you one simple question. What are you building or what do you want to build? Mm -hmm. And uh, the answer is honestly up to you. If you want to, you know, evangelize Zerkit and, and produce uh, videos uh, that show users, you know, how to bridge the, their mm -hmm. assets onto Zerkit, that's totally possible and that's actually useful. If you want to develop documentation that is, uh, you know, in your mother language, which might not be English, yeah. this is again absolutely mm -hmm. useful. If you are building an actual smart contract project, this is absolutely useful. Mm -hmm. So we actually are absolutely down to reward all of these uh, builders mm -hmm. and all of these I creators. Uh, and that's why this uh, builds to earn program is so loose. And so the way how it works is that uh, whatever you are doing, uh, you will simply fill out that form and uh, one of our community managers and uh, ecosystem managers will reach out to you. Uh, they will confirm the accuracy of everything. They will offer uh, various you know, support. So uh, that can be ranging from uh, grants mm -hmm. over marketing activities, over connections in the space. You know, for example, you might yeah. need smart contract audit, you might need to be connected with other investors, right? We essentially want to support everybody mm -hmm. in the way that they need to be supported. So this is what the Builds to Earn uh, program mm -hmm. is about. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's the, exactly the things that I think it is uh, kind of interesting, because usually the Building means kind of the dev works, right? Yes. But for the jerk it looks like the building means the much bigger work, right? Exactly. There's uh, many meaning for the building for the jerk it. And I think that's the reason that you guys can get this kind of the big strengths among the communities in the global world, right? Thank you. We, yeah, hope, yeah. we hope that this is absolutely correct and it is absolutely yeah, yeah. our goal. Uh, that's great, yeah. And yeah, everyone watching this video is maybe anticipate, uh, preparing for the Zerk mainnet launch, right? <laughs> and what's the kind of the key features can you share for the users and uh, our audience? Because they are not familiar with the tech world. So if you can share some more easier way of the explanation, it would be very helpful for them to understand okay. the Zerk kit, yeah. So uh, Zerk and mainnet, it already launched. And the key features that we wanted to bring uh, to the market at the beginning is a network that is reliable, that is fast, mm -hmm. and that is cheap to use. 
Okay, so those are the key features. And what I already mentioned, we wanted for this network to be, you know, usable in exactly the same way how uh, the other rollup networks or Ethereum mainnet are usable. So exactly the same tools, exactly the same wallets, uh, nothing to change. Now, uh, I said that the network already launched. So uh, we launched the very first uh, iteration of uh, mainnet uh, at the beginning of July. We kept this uh, mainnet uh, private for the duration of July, and it was open only to our partners and the projects who early committed to actually building and deploying something on Zerkit. So we gave them this like one entire month to actually set up their smart, smart contract uh, deploy the front ends, uh, integrate everything together, make sure that it functions for the users. Uh, we were actually doing exactly the same with our uh, yeah. bridge that we are providing to the users, you know, fine tuning the block explorer that we have developed for the network, um, you know, doing various tests on the uh, security uh, layer and so on. Now, during this phase, uh, we actually imposed uh, some limits because again, we wanted to make sure that the, you know, network is released in a very responsible and uh, secure way. So uh, during this phase, we only uh, allowed a very low amount of ether to be bridged for every address onto the network. And we also uh, had a global limit. Now, as of August, uh, we moved to uh, phase one of mainnet uh, where uh, we are actually continuously increasing these limits. So mm -hmm. first of all, we made the network public. So if you go to uh, zerkit.com, uh, you will be able to find in the documentation how to connect to this uh, network, how to configure it in your um, Web3 wallet, be it MetaMask or be the different uh, wallet that you prefer using. So uh, you will you know, right away be able to use the network and uh, you will also find the materials in there that show you how to bridge assets onto mainnet and so on. Mm -hmm. And so uh, with this uh, phase approaching or, you know, it actually already started, uh, we are also gradually lifting the caps, mm -hmm. right? Because we did have that testing period where yeah, we, you know, verified the network is absolutely mm -hmm. functional. So uh, right now, uh, the network is uh, configured so that for every single individual address, it allows up to 50 ethers to be uh, bridged onto the network. Uh, throughout September, that cap is going to actually be completely uh, removed. Mm -hmm. We will also on the front end that we are using for the bridge uh, enable bridging of ERC20 tokens that's going to be uncapped from the very beginning uh, yeah. and you know I think that this is actually going to mark the uh, true 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 beginning of uh, the circuit yeah, journey yeah. yeah I see I see and um, there is the kind of the doors in the task and I think you guys are making really great exposure <laughs> like the using the this kind of the character and they are kind of the memes now so many Web3 users are using these cat characters. Can you share some more details about the why you guys are using this kind of the way to spreading the jerky to the users? Yeah, absolutely. So I said that we launched our testnet at yeah, DevConnect yeah. in Istanbul. In Istanbul, uh, you know, you have cats everywhere. You oh. walk on the street and, yeah. uh, you know, you can pet oh. a cat on every single oh, corner. Yeah. They are just <laughs> like great. literally, yeah. you know, Great as thing. frequent in the city as humans. And oh. uh, <laughs> honestly, cats are incredibly oh, cute. Yeah. And we like, you know, cute things. So we decided, hey, maybe, you know, we need a mascot and a cat is yeah, a very yeah, yeah. suitable mascot because it relates to our journey, right? Uh, so we did exactly that. And that's why <laughs> yeah. we are using cats. Yeah, I think that was really successful. And I didn't know that the starting of the cat character is the Istanbul. Yes. Yeah, that's a very funny story. And <laughs> you guys are also focusing on the things like the making a community of the workers, right? So I see you guys are hosting more than three events in the KBW seasons, and it does all the great. Yes. And I also see the things like the Turkish festival. Is that kind of the thing similar like the, this kind of event? 
So uh, these are two separate things. First of all, we are hosting events uh, everywhere at every uh, major you know Web three event that uh, is happening this yeah. year. Uh, we are coming. We are hosting events. Uh, we are talking to developers. We are talking to end users. Uh, we are literally doing the community building work. We fully recognize that uh, we are a fresh project. Again, like we have you know released uh, the mainnet you know this summer right so uh we might not have had as much exposure as other brands out there but i think that we are doing great with that mm -hmm. so uh we are trying to go literally everywhere we are connecting with people and to our users uh you know we are helping everybody wherever we can and uh, we are building the community what uh Zirkit festival is about uh again this is all mm -hmm. documented on our website mm -hmm. so it actually really relates uh, to the launch of our mainnet and of our yeah. governance token. So uh, what we are currently doing after you know launching mainnet, uh, we again full recognize that we need some user activity on the mainnet and some traffic and you know the projects that uh, we are you know so nicely attracting and uh, you know working with uh, that are deploying on Zirkit, they also want users, right? So uh, we uh, launched a program where uh, if users come and if they do anything on Zirkid mainnet, uh, be it bridging, be it uh, transferring Ether from one account to another, using some dApp, using some project that exists, uh, we on a weekly basis uh, take snapshot of mm -hmm. all the gas that was spent uh, on the network and we reward these users for their loyalty uh, mm -hmm. with our governance token at a certain rate, right? So this is what Zirkid Mainnet Festival is about. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, this is an invitation for uh, all the yeah. users to actually come to try the network, mm, you know, to see the extremely cheap gas fees that we mm -hmm. currently have and the uh, speed that we, you know, can provide uh, to discover some projects that uh, exists, uh, that exist on the network mm -hmm. and to join our community. Mm. Yeah, that's great. So that's the reason that you guys are calling it as the, right? Festival. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, see, see. We, we want Zirkids <laughs> to be welcoming everybody to one big party. Like a festival. <laughs> yeah, like a party. Uh, yes. I see, I see. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you very much for sharing your time today. And lastly, is there any kind of the message that you want to deliver for the Korean audience? Yes, so I do have a message. Zerkit is here. Zerkit is here for you. Uh, we are doing everything as responsibly as we can. Uh, we want to, again, build a network that is cheap, that is fast and that is secure. And, you know, the best thing that you can do for us if you want to join us on this journey is to come and try Zerkit on your own. That's mm, it. Thank you. Yeah. And I suddenly have the additional questions for you. Okay. So. Why we need a Web3 network? Why we need a Web3 network in your opinion? Why do we need Web3 network in the first place? Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me think about how to put this. Sure, yeah. I think that, uh, so in my view, uh, Web3 networks, uh, they sort of, operate like very open and friendly banks. Mm -hmm. They actually allow you to do, you know, everything that a banking service provides uh, you with. So you can transfer some assets from your account to another account, right? If you go to a bank, uh, uh, yeah. You also have some digital representation of your uh, funds, right? right? So you are transferring these assets. You can loan money from the bank. You can mm -hmm. borrow money from the bank. Uh, you can invest money in the bank. Now, what you absolutely cannot do in the bank is come and say, dear bank, I actually don't think that your financial product is working as you know uh, the general audience needs mm -hmm. it. I am going to deploy and start providing my own banking product mm -hmm. within your bank, right? Mm -hmm. You cannot extend their system. So I see this as the tremendous strength 
of uh, Web3. It is like a bank that allows you to implement your own applications, mm -hmm. your own I financial see. instruments, your own financial systems, your own everything. And it allows for everybody to access these systems. Mm -hmm. And so it's absolutely possible for you to actually show up and say, yes, I will extend it. And it goes even beyond because we do have, you know, very creative applications such as NFTs, such as games. So it's not just a bank. It's mm -hmm. just anything in the world that mm -hmm. you would like to integrate with this financial system. And that's the true strength of Web3. Mm -hmm. I see, yeah. That is kind of the certain question, but thank you very much for sharing your thought. I think it will be helpful for our audience to understand about why we need a Web3, right? Mm. Okay, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your time today, Martin. And this is the Martin from the Turkey. 저렇게 세 공동 창업자 마틴님과 함께 오늘 이야기를 나눠봤고요. Thank you very much. 앞으로 저렇게에 대해서 한국 시청자분들도 많은 관심 보여주시길 바라겠습니다. 감사합니다. 바이바이. <웃음> 네, 감사합니다. 아, 땡큐 바이. 아, 쌤.